Hi there, class. Welcome uh, to this week's lecture. This is chapter, <clears throat> excuse me, chapter uh, 14 on uh, B2B marketing internationally. And we just did B2C in chapter 13 two weeks ago. Um, so let's dive right in. This is, uh, if you have, don't recognize her, this is Beth Comstock. She's the CMO of GE. She says, whether B2B or B2C, I believe passionately that good marketing essentials are the same. We're all looking, we are all emotional beings looking for relevance, context, and connection. And we'll talk a lot about this. Um, context is a big theme in marketing right now. Um, you'll see more and more of that, especially, you know, content marketing has kind of been on the rise for the past seven or eight years. And um, over the past year or so, um, context for that content has started to kind of move to the forefront. And so you'll hear more and more of that if you continue your careers in marketing. Okay, chapter 14, we're talking about B2B, that's business to business um, marketing. Jumping in, here's the cliff notes as usual. So as you think about it, um, so B2B marketing is much bigger than it appears. As consumers, we don't actually see this very often. It's kind of invisible to us how much, uh, how many transactions and how, um, and the volume of uh, just just the sheer volume of money that is moving around in B2B purchases because we're not the target, so it's invisible to us. Um, in terms of our kind of age-old question about standardization versus adaptation, in B2B, this is less just less important. Um, and the reason is because the needs are, are more clearly defined and more similar uh, for B2B purchase. So you just don't have the kind of variety that you would have in a B2C environment. Um, one of the reasons for that is what's the goals? Well, in a B2C environment, we're looking for customer satisfaction. Um, the buyer wants to be happy with their purchase. In a B2B environment, it's all about is this a profitable decision for the for the company who's buying? So look at the risks uh, that are um, associated with each of these. In terms of consumer satisfaction, like let's say that you buy a shirt and then you don't like it. Well, it's not that big of a risk. It doesn't hurt you that much financially. Um, you might not go back to that store or might not buy that brand again, but in the grand scheme of things, it's not that big of a risk. Um, on the other hand, if let's say that you're, you're a buyer in a B2B environment and you're buying a, a piece of manufacturing equipment and you make the decision to buy that piece of equipment and then the, the equipment just totally fails. In that case, your job's on the line. So the risks are much greater um, for purchasers of B2B products in general. Here's some, re some ways that B2B differs from B2C. So, and these are rooted in what we just talked about in the, in the, uh, the different risks. The first thing is it's longer. B2B sales cycles are typically much longer than B2C. You, you're not going to find B2B products that are stacked up on the aisle on your way out to checkout. Right? There's not the idea of, of impulse purchases uh, and short-term purchases. It just does, does not happen very often in B2B. Um, and a, uh, we call that um, being more or less considered of a purchase. So the more considered purchases, this is somebody who digs into the details, does all the research. Um, this is, if you're selling cars, right, this is the guy who shows up and he's already read the manuals and he's looked everything up online. Well, in a B2B environment, that is the most common way that those, those sales are made. It's much less uh, emotional. Even though um, what Beth Comstock is talking about in our quote of the week about Look, we're all human beings. We all have emotions, and, and that emotional connection um, influences our purchase. Uh, B2B is still more considered. It's going to be, there's going to be more evaluation, more uh, taking our time to make sure we have everything uh, worked out. Now, at the end of the day, it still may be that I choose, uh, I choose the vendor for whom I, that I like the best, who's the most likable, most personable, has the best soft skills. Um, but Either way, I'm going to do my research before I, I, I pull the trigger on that purchase. Um, there's also more people to deal with. So uh, for those of you who have done B2B sales, you'll know this. Um, a, a business to business sale is not a one to one sale. It's a one to many. So the salesperson in a B2B environment has to find all the stakeholders um, that are involved in making the decision uh, on the buying company side. And you'll, you'll hear terms like, okay, I need to find out who my champion is, who's my economic buyer, 
who is the influencers? What does the, the political org chart look like in the, in the target company? And some new stats on, on this are that um, it used to be, you know, uh, 10 years ago when I was doing the marketing for AtTask, which is now Workfront, um, we were often trying to get to the C-level executive to make the decision. That was where the budget authority uh, lied. So we were trying to get to the CIO as we're selling project management software into um, these, these firms. That is not so much the case today. So the way that things have changed is there's much more purchasing authority delegated to people um, lower down in the org chart. And as a result, that, that also means that they're younger. So if you're profiling or creating uh, personas for who the roles are in the B2B purchase process, those personas oftentimes are now people from 25 to 35. They're, they're you know, maybe younger than 40 years old, where 10 years ago, those people would all have been senior, uh, senior managers in the target company. Um, and on the whole, this is a lengthier relationship. A lot of times that has to do with that it takes time to implement, it takes time to um, get everything up to speed, there's ongoing training and things like that. And also there, it, it may be that this purchase recurs. So all of the effort that goes into making this buying decision the first time, um, you, people are loath to go through that effort again. They don't want to, to revisit this in-depth decision every year. And as a result, once you're in in a deal like that, you become uh, the incumbent. It's hard to unseat because they're, people don't want to go to the work of, of opening that decision back up and coming back to it. Um, and as a result, the relationship is longer. Also, there's typically a smaller group of leads. So you have a smaller, um, the, the market is oftentimes measured in dollars. So the market may be much bigger, but the points of contact, the actual leads, the contacts that you're going to make uh, to, to uh, close a sale like this are smaller. Okay, I want to talk to you about the concept of derived demand. Um, in, in B2B, there's a natural volatility that is rooted in derived demand. And we talked about this in earlier chapters about how volatility in general is tough for business. Business likes stable political climates, stable economic climates. Um, the more things are predictable and the same, the, the easier it is for, for business to forecast, predict, and thrive. Well, in B2B, you have some uh, natural increased, naturally increased volatility. And we're going to talk about that. So here's a, here's a quick case study. So um, here's a salesperson for this company called MeshUp. They manufacture industrial machinery for making and shaping fiberglass. So what do they use that for? Here's one of their machines, and they use this for making fiberglass shower stalls, kind of like this. Um, and so we're going to take a look at the demand. One of our machines can build 200 of these shower stalls per year. So let's, uh, let's do a little, uh, a little case. Year one, there are 100,000 units um, in demand in the market. So we need, uh, we take that, we know that each machine can do 200 units a year. So that means I need 500 units. Um, I need 500 units out there in the marketplace producing this 100,000 uh, uh, shower stalls. And... 50, uh, the machines are, uh, have a life cycle that means that I'm going to have 50 of those units that need to be replaced every year. So in this case, we're starting year one without any new units, and just the replacement, it means I'm going to have to sell 50 uh, of these machines just to, just to keep even with the, the demand. So now let's take a look and say year two, hey, demand is going up. This is a good thing, right? Demand goes up to 110,000 units, which is a, a, a change of an additional 10,000 units of demand. And so in order to get those additional 10,000 units, right, I divide that by 200 uh, shower stalls, and that gives me another 50 uh, units that I need to be out there uh, producing shower stalls. And that's 50 more than I had in year one. So now I look at, at uh, how many units I have to sell this year. I've got the same 50 to replace the ones that are going bad, plus 50 new units. And so I've got 100 units to sell this year. Well, I only had 50 units to sell last year. So that's a 100% that's a increase. So, I mean, how, how can you go wrong with this, right? I have a 10% increase in the demand in the market, and that generates a 100% increase in my sales. 
I'm feeling pretty good about this, right? Um, let's keep it going. Now, year three, the demand continues to grow. It doesn't grow quite as much. You know, so we go from 110 to 115,000 total units of demand. That is an increase of 5,000 units. We take those 5,000 units, divide it by 200 shower stalls per unit, and that means that the total units I need out in the market is 575, or an increase of 25 units. Now, uh, I, I'm still going to have the same 50 units that I have to replace every year, but only 25 new. So my total unit sold actually goes down, goes from 100 down to 75. So you start to see what's happening here that I, I'm still having a, an increase in demand, but the increase isn't, the, the growth rate isn't as steep. And that's caused me to have um, a reduction in the number of units that I can sell. And you see the same dynamic in, uh, at work uh, as you see reporting on startup companies. And they're growing, growing, growing at, a, at an astronomical rate. And then their growth rate slows, but they, they're still growing. And so everybody's like, well, look, I'm still growing. What's, what's the problem? But the reason is just like this. As the growth rate slows, the ability to predict how, you know, how, much, uh, how many new units uh, it's going to take, how much new volume of sales it's going to take to keep them going, um, the ability to predict that shrinks, and it, and it may even cause a reduction like this. Let's, see, let's add another year. So in the next year is still growing, but growth rate, again, tapers off a little bit. Uh, so we're up to 118,000 uh, units of demand for the year. That's an increase of 3,000 units. Divide that by 200 units. That means we have an additional 15 units that we need to sell in addition to the, the 50 replacement units. Uh, looks like our sales total took another hit. We went from 75 down to 65. Oh, there, we had a market fluctuation here in year five. We went down by 18,000 units. We're back to the same. There's still a lot of demand, right? There's still 100,000 units worth of demand. That's the same as we were five years earlier, but it looks like that, that uh, we had extra inventory in the market, and now the market doesn't, the, the demand isn't as high. Well, okay, so same 500 units, but that's 90 less units than I needed the year before. So if I take a look at that, um, I've, I've already, the market's already got enough units to absorb its replacements, plus uh, 40 less units. So I'm, I'm not going to sell anything at all this year. Well, we're talking about pretty minor changes on the demand side, making huge changes on the, uh, the sales side. Yikes. So not quite as awesome when the same relatively minor fluctuation results in zero sales. This is called the bullwhip effect. And effectively, what that, what that means is that a small motion at the handle side of the bullwhip causes huge swings um, out on the end. Get another year coming along, right? And the demand stays flat. Um, and now I'm starting to absorb some of that excess inventory. I'm making some sales. But look at the difference in my sales. Take a look at that total column. The, the volatility uh, of that is all because the demand for uh, new sales is derived from fluctuations in the overall demand of the, uh, in the marketplace. Um, and, and that can be really difficult. And this, this is part of the nature of B2B, uh, of B2B marketing is just I have to reckon with this. So if I, if I haven't budgeted for the fact that I might have some fat years and some lean years, then one of these fluctuations could just wipe me out. So what's the lesson learned? Derived demand results in more volatility. Why do we call this derived demand? It's because it's the demand at the point of sale is derived from uh, things that are happening up the value chain. Um, demand from, on a consumer basis is right at the point of purchase. The consumer is where the demand lives. It's not derived from some other relationship or some other thing that's happening. But in B2B, we often have derived demand. Okay, shifting gears a little bit, uh, we'll talk about how economic development affects, um, affects the demand for products and services uh, in a B2B way. So uh, we've talked about the stages of economic development before, talked about how uh, uh, as countries and uh, geographies develop economically, they start to have, buyers have start having more choice, they start uh, selecting products that are more niche, well, let's take a look at how this affects B2B products. Um, if my country is less developed, 
you remember when we talked about the population shifts and how um, if if my company if my country is more economically developed, that usually translates into a longer lifespan. For me. well, if I'm the the political leaders here, I'm you know how great am I if I increase the lifespan of everybody in my country on average by ten years? So I got a lot of motivation for uh, industrializing for for moving my economic development along uh, to the next stage, and that may mean that as a government. I'm interested in purchasing certain products. I might want to be purchasing products that are used to improve our infrastructure. I might be wanting to purchase project products that improve our manufacturing capability. And so now, as a seller of B2B products, the company who's buying is actually a foreign government. And that introduces some political issues um, where we're taking a look at, at the, the temperature of, of the political climate. It may be much more important. It may be that I have much more regulatory issues to deal with. Um, and it may be that, that this country wants to progress, but maybe its neighbors are content for it to not, uh, to not progress economically. And so I might have to navigate that. I might already be selling to one of the neighbors, and that could introduce complications in my selling to the, the target company. So uh, as we take a look at what, what uh, each of these stages mean, the least economically developed stage is what we call traditional society. That's stage one. And in stage one, countries are exploiting their raw materials. It's like I have a country. It's a location with a geography. I have stuff in this geography, and that's the stuff I have to try to make money. So it's agriculture. I'm going to grow some stuff on my land. It's raw materials. It's minerals. Um, it's uh, the, the stuff that I can just find where I am. Step two is called preconditions for takeoff. So this is um, the prerequisites for this country to start to really accelerate its economic development. And so what's happening here? Early manufacturing, I'm, I'm starting to build stuff. I'm starting to put thing, raw materials together and make uh, more finished goods. And I'm focusing on infrastructure. Just a note about infrastructure. This is like, imagine uh, the United States pre-interstate uh, highway system. If you can imagine this, um, Go back 50 years, and even like right here in our area, in Orem, if I want to go to Salt Lake, I, I drive on State Street, and I drive right through every town along the way. I stop at every stoplight, and my trip between, from Orem to Salt Lake City now takes me an hour plus instead of 25 minutes. Well, that's the, that's the influence of infrastructure. In the face-to-face in, in the -face -face class, we had uh, one of the groups doing their group project was doing um, something in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And they brought up uh, an example where the, you're, it's in the jungle. And a trip to move goods from one city to another was a multi-day trip, uh, it, two or three days to get from one to the other. The, the government came in and said, okay, we're going to build a road. This is, a, this is an important infrastructure project. They built the road, and now the same trip takes two hours. Um, that's the power of infrastructure. The thing is, is that um, it's, it is often difficult for private groups to have the um, return on investment horizon long enough to make sense to invest in infrastructure. So it's, infrastructure is typically a government or a large company uh, project. Because it needs to be somebody, because the return is usually not immediate. It's a, it takes a while to, to generate the return on the investment it takes to establish the infrastructure. Where we see that a lot right now is, you know, we have the interstate highway system in the U.S. You're seeing some other places in the world, right? The, um, is it the Amazon highway that, that cuts, uh, that essentially transects South America from east to west? You know, anticipate that that project will produce a lot of economic benefit. What kind of infrastructure projects are we looking at here? We've got, got pretty good roads. Um, internet infrastructure. How fast, what is the, what is the core internet, in, excuse me, the core internet infrastructure look like? And what does that do to facilitate transactions and commerce? Um, and as we make those investments uh, in infrastructure, it facilitates the economic growth. Now, Building on top of that infrastructure, we start to take the manufacturing to another level. We manu manufacture more sophisticated goods, the goods that require more types of raw materials. Um, and as a result, we need to buy the type of equipment that it takes uh, to, to, 
to manufacture these things. This is um, this is where post World War II Japan was. They're a country not not long on raw materials, right? Pretty small. Um, don't have a you know. It's not like Japan is going to uh, start um, exporting uh, farming. You know, they just don't have the land. So what did they do? They start uh, they they focus their economy on importing raw materials, manufacturing, and exporting manufactured goods. And that process allowed Japan to become the second largest economy in the world. It's only, it's only three or four years uh, since China surpassed Japan as the number two economy in the world. So for, since the 1980s, Japan has been the number two economy behind the United States, all because they were in this takeoff stage and, and following this pattern. So what comes after that? The drive to maturity. So here in stage four, we're talking about um, now we're fine-tuning our manufacturing. This is Japan going from a toy manufacturer to a um, high-tech electronic manufacturer. Um, all kinds of machines now become in demand uh, in order to produce this. We also have the introduction of what's called capital products. So these are, these are essentially uh, products that you buy that are forms of money. So what's a capital product? Well, um, insurance is a great example of a capital product. Um, it's, it's just a transaction about money. Um, I don't buy a good or a service. Um, another thing would be securities. Buying stocks or bonds um, is a, pure, a purely financial transaction. There's, it's not rooted in a good or a service. And then ultimately, step, stage five is the mass consumption stage. This is what we normally associate with the most developed world. So the United States, um, the, de the most developed parts of Europe, um, this is where you start to have a focus on design. You start to have a focus on uh, service. Uh, if you look at the United States, it's very much becoming uh, more of a service economy than a manufacturing economy. Now, interestingly enough, if we look at the, the last election, one of the themes of the last election is that Trump was appealing to the Rust Belt, which is essentially a swath of the United States that is not in this stage. They're actually back in this stage. And Trump's saying, hey, look, these guys have been left behind as, as companies that are actually, for the most part, in this stage, are outsourcing their service to other parts of the, of the world that are still in the maturity or the maturing um, stage. So, uh, and then here's the, here's the real uh, lesson. So here's all the, all, these, um, all the stages, traditional, right, raw materials, agricultural, preconditions, early manufacturing, uh, uh, dedicated investments into infrastructure, takeoff, we're leveraging that infrastructure, our manufacturing is getting more complex, we're doing more of it, our, we're dialing up our volume in maturing, we're getting to very high tech manu or very complex manufacturing, the introduction of capital products that fuel all of this, and ultimately mass consumption, where you're talking about world leadership in production and the ability to, to specialize um, in the, the things that you want to import and how you're, how you're uh, conducting that trade. And here's the takeaway. A country doesn't have to be in only one stage. When we talk about the example of, trust in the, of Trump and the Rust Belt, well, the Rust Belt is a swath of the country that isn't in stage five. You know, the, the, um, not, the, not the geography so much as the economy, the companies that are, that are focused on manufacturing, they're in a, stage four, um, in a stage four mindset. And their, their process and what they're doing is in stage four. So they're feeling left behind by the, by the coasts that are very much deep into stage five. Um, and, and you get that. So if, if you can be in more than one stage at a time, then you, you have to ask yourself, well, do I have to hit all the stages? But what if I'm in a stage one or two company? Can I jump all the way to a stage five and skip stages three or four? Well, we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, technology and, quali and quality. This is from the text. The adequacy of a product must be considered in relation to the general environment in which it will be operated rather than solely on the basis of technical efficiency. So when we think about that, this is kind of like, I like to imagine, let's say I went back in time. I'm in the medieval times and I slap my iPhone down on the table. 
Is the technology awesome? Yes, the technology is awesome. Is it also useless? Yes, the technology is useless because it's, it doesn't relate to the environment in which it will be operated. There's no cell site towers. There is no data. There's no internet connection. So all of the things that I need for that technology to actually be awesome don't exist. Well, think about that in, <coughs> in terms of uh, trying to introduce a higher tech product into a country that, that may be in an earlier economic development stage. Here's an example. Um, in the U.S., uh, there's, there may be a market for GPS-guided tractors. There may be a market for driverless farming equipment. Um, and the, the underlying infrastructure, right, GPS and, and other things could be, uh, well, uh, could be mature enough to support that. But if I try to take that same technology and go to you know, sub-Saharan Africa, I don't have any of the infrastructure that I need to support that kind of tech. Does it make the tech less awesome? No, the tech's super awesome. It's just worthless in the wrong environment. So again, the question, can we, can we leap over stages? Um, here's an example of how, what it looks like to leap over stages. So in, in Africa, there, so this is, in fact, this is a couple years old already. And we're saying that in three years, most Africans will have smartphones. So I don't know if we've tipped the scales in terms of 50% of Africans uh, having smartphones yet or not, but it's, it's headed that direction. Well, Africa did not go through the stages the United States went through. They didn't go through the development of a, a complex copper infrastructure. By the time they were ready to make this leap, they already had examples in the developed world of what mobile technology looked like. So Africa was able to, to make their infrastructure investment in um, cell site towers and the supporting infrastructure it takes to support mobile uh, devices and never had to go through the process of just laying a ton of copper everywhere. The best indicator of whether a country can do this is its education system. So education provides the fuel for leapfrogging in your economic development. Now we're in a kind of a weird, um, a weird phase in the in the U.S. right now because education, um, the return on investment for education is moving, it's moving in a negative direction. Um, you guys, you guys are well aware of this, right? You're, you're as you take a look at what uh, you, know, you go to college because you want to get out of college and and uh, have an opportunity to get a better job. You're college is expensive, you graduate, you may have student loans, and, and you're saddled with these. It's, it's kind of interesting to look at that, like the average payback period on student loans. Um, students that are graduating today are actually becoming indentured servants longer than the seven years that indentured servants um, were back in the, in the colonial period. Um, that is an economic condition that is, that is messed up. So not to, not to frighten you, like I'm a big fan of education. I think education is great. The economics of education, though, are a little out of whack, a little out of whack right now. Even if you look at the cost of education, you know, at UVU is a, is a pretty good buy, but a lot of colleges around the country are horrendously expensive. And the, the ROI on those, so if we, look at, if we look at how much more as a college graduate from one of these institutions you will make, you will earn over your lifetime, it's starting to become less of a favorable situation to go to college. The, it, it, another way of looking at that is the net present value of a college education is, is dropping. And the result is, or and the, and the reason for that is that costs are going up and then people are still graduating and can't find jobs. Um, now, you know, depends on what industry you're in, depends on what your degree is. Um, you, this is the business school, so you know, we, find, we kind of find a way to make, make our own work. Um, but uh, that's the caveat for what I'm about to tell you about education, which is education is kind of the key to countries being able to leapfrog their, uh, their economic development. So you see that countries like China, Russia, the Czech Republic, um, making heavy investments in education in their people with the entire um, focus of this is an investment we're making to leapfrog in our economic development because we want to be uh, we want to be world leaders. We want to move in to the stage five mass consumption uh, phase. Um, 
and it's it's a competitive world. So the investment that they're making in this is not just so that their country can do better, their people can do better, but it's because it's competitive between them and everybody around them, and they want to be out in front. Um, this is an interesting infographic about um, countries and their current investment in building out uh, additional digital capacity. This is not a smooth spectrum of, uh, of growth. So, excuse me, you can see here, like the Scandinavian countries, they're kind of in the stall out phase. They've made some early investments, but they're not making a lot of new investments. Um, look at the standout, right? U.S. is kind of barely into the standout group. So we still have a lot of areas where we're making deep investments, but, but we're not like going crazy with this. Um, it would be easy for us to ease off of our infrastructure investments and slip uh, into the stall out category. The watchouts are countries that are not catching up. Uh, they, they didn't make the investment earlier and they're not making it now. And the breakout countries are those that are, you know, they're making heavy investments. They, they want to be leaders in terms of their digital infrastructure. Now, that's, uh, that kind of gives us a look at technology. What about quality? Um, one of the things that is often missed by B2B marketers is exactly what, you know, how quality fits in the picture. Well, here's, here's why. Quality involves a whole bunch of stuff. It's not just, um, hey, my, uh, what's a good example? Maybe diamonds. Um, so I'm gonna look at diamonds, I'm looking, I'm looking at clarity and size and color, and these are, are easy things to measure so everybody has the same idea of quality. Most things aren't like that. You wrap all of these things together, right? What's the price compared to the value? What are the, the um, attending support services? What, uh, what are the actual technical specs? And then what kind of standards were used both in the manufacturer and in the finished product? And this, all of this wrapped together forms the, the essence of quality. And how those things are appreciated is totally determined on the buyer. So one of the things that that entrepreneurs sometimes miss is they go out and they build a better mousetrap. They build something that is, um, in their minds, pure, you know, you're clearly superior to what's on the market. But if the buyer doesn't agree, then all of that effort is meaningless um, because the buyer determines, yes, I, I believe that that's higher quality than my other choices. Um, now, real quick, this is... so buyers are subject to all of the cultural differences that we've been talking about all semester. So the ISO, the International Standards Organization, um, came up with a set of standards, and this is not, this is not, um, this is not a set of standards for uh, finished goods, but it does create a set of standards for manufacturing processes. So uh, in other words, this, uh, if I build a product and it meets ISO 9000, then it means that it was built with the same standards as a product built, with IS, built according to ISO 9000 from another country. And that gives us a baseline uh, for quality standards, at least in how we make stuff. Now, if you remember a few weeks ago, we had the, uh, the case study about the pork livers ordered from Germany and shipped from the United States. And the, um, the, the definition of quality was different in the two cultures. Well, ISO is an attempt to try to standardize what quality standards mean in, in manufacturing um, across countries. It has, has been successful at this. It's just important to understand that it's, you're talking about the manufacturing process and not the actual uh, products uh, themselves. Uh, a quick look at account-based marketing. So if you, if you work in a marketing field right now, you, you're probably hearing some of the buzz around account-based marketing. You go back a couple of years, this was called relationship marketing, um, and, and the principles behind account-based marketing have been around for years. But uh, this, is the, this is the new buzzword that, that people are latching onto. And effectively what this means is that I'm focused on a long-term relationship. I'm focused on the lifetime value of a customer. And in B2B, I might, what if I'm selling into the, the Fortune 500? I only got five, there's only 500 companies in the Fortune 500. And so how many do I need? Well, maybe I need more depth than breadth. Maybe I need accounts that are, um, that are heavily adopted with, with big um, PO numbers as opposed to just a lot, the high volume of customers. 
Well, account-based marketing kind of makes that assumption. It says, well, we're going to get sales and marketing together on the same page, and we're going to focus in on what does it take to land certain accounts. So maybe I sell something that I, and I want to AT&T to buy it, for example. Well, the, between the sales and marketing team, we're going to find out who, uh, who are the people at AT&T that make the buying decision. We're going to profile them. We're going to start looking and saying, okay, are any of these people active on social media? Are any of these people uh, bloggers or have their works published somewhere? And if they do, we're going to like their stuff. We're, we might cite some of their stuff in our own content. And then we're going to reach out to them and say, hey, uh, we noticed you had this awesome uh, awesome article that you published. We, we uh, cited you over in our article over here. And what's that going to do? No, nowhere in that process have we asked them for a sale. But what it's going to do is start building a relationship. They're going to become aware of us because we just did something nice for them. Um, and we're going to try to do that for all of the key uh, stakeholders in this deal. What our, our early objectives are is awareness and engagement. We want, them, we want them to DM us on Twitter and say, hey, I saw what you did there. That was really cool. Um, we want to understand what they're interested in, what they think is, is uh, important. Um, and we want to use those, those tools to strategically go after and say, look, we're the company that you want to do business with um, because we've done a whole bunch of things that says we're in your tribe. We get the world the same way as you do. Um, and that's kind of the heart of account-based marketing. Again, all about the idea that this relationship is going to be long. In the, in the early slide, we talked about how B2B relationships tend to be longer. Well, uh, as a result of that, if we land this relationship, unlikely it will be unseated. And so that makes it worth it for us to do more, to invest more heavily and be more strategic um, in how we tackle it up front. And that's, that's really the core of ABM. Okay, quick look at different types of trade connections. Trade shows, trade fairs, and trade centers. Um, trade shows are private events. Oftentimes that means they're put on by associations or um, you know, they could be you know, trade associations, could be lobbies, could be magazines, but some private group. And the, the entire purpose is to get buyers and sellers together. Um, this particular example, you can see this is, is a European trade show where they've got the booths are more this hard shell um, type setup rather than kind of the pipe and drape that you see in American trade shows. But same, same exact function. This is a place where, uh, where sellers come and um, you know, post their wares and buyers come and, and try to make a connection. Um, so what's the difference between that and a trade fair? Well, trade fairs have the exact same purpose. The only difference is that they're sponsored by, uh, by a local or national government. So I think this is a, a trade fair in New Delhi. And um, why would a government do this? Well, for the same reason that governments might be um, consumers of B2B products. They're looking at opportunities to increase the commerce um, in their jurisdiction so that they can increase the, the transactions and the wealth of their citizens and try to make those economic development leaps. A trade center, on the other hand, is a permanent fixture. So this is, the, uh, this is a trade center in Las Vegas. And when I was doing the marketing for um, the retail division of Provo Craft, which was the Roberts Craft Stores, um, a lot of the vendors that we bought, like silk florals, and things like that from, um, when this opened, they, uh, they took up shop here. So essentially you have a permanent exhibit. Uh, you have a trade show that's going on uh, every day of the year, and your buyers can fly in and meet with you um, anytime that, that fits your schedule. Um, and so you have these trade centers have cropped up around the country. Um, and then really, if you, go, if you go back far enough, this is the root of the, the World Trade Center. Um, but ultimately, the World Trade Center wasn't so much of a showroom as a, a bunch of offices for international companies. But the idea is, is the same. It's a permanent fixture for people to come and find you to, to do commerce. Services. So not everything that we sell internationally is products. A lot of it can be services just like it is domestically. Um, and just like uh, um, consumer-focused services are, are huge, so are B2B services. Um, this is a, a look at the um, Department of Commerce report for uh, exports. And there's a huge services category right up there at the top. 
looks like the services total here is about 29.5%, so about, about a third of um, all of the exports were service related. The um, potential is there for services to be produced more revenue even than the sale of the product. So this is kind of like a razors and razor bla blades or printers and ink um, dynamic. In this case, maybe I maybe somebody bought some software from me or they bought a piece of, of equipment from me and that's not the end of the relationship. Um, well, after they buy it, they need uh, assistance from me to onboard their uh, their people so they can get the utilization of it, get it up and running, get it set up. Um, they may have uh, ongoing training that where they're going to hire me to come in and train their people on how to use this equipment or how to use the software. And all of those things cost money. There are, um, and usually the margins in service oriented things are pretty high. Um, so I think I saw recently, I think it was salesforce.com, uh, a picture of their revenue. Their services revenue is is not bigger than their um, their regular sales revenue, but the margins are higher in it. So it provides a, a very profitable component to their business. And in some cases, the, the you know it could be higher. Um, again, you know post sale services. This is I, we sold something. We're not done. I'm gonna have to come in, set it up for you. I'm gonna have to train your people on how to use it. Um, and and ultimately, all of that can can produce more, more profit or more money, just pure revenue, than the sale of the original product. Okay, that's it for this chapter. Um, I'll post chapter 15 um, probably here in a couple of days. I'm traveling next week, so um, probably midweek you'll see chapter 15 show up. Um, as always, reach out to me if you need anything. Have a wonderful week. Thank you.